Hey there, Pathfinders. Welcome to the Pathfinders podcast. My name is Tam Ko. I am your host. And in every episode, I interview guests with uncommon, interesting career or life journey. And sitting with me today is Mark C. Close. He is known as the ENTJ on my blog, for those of you who follow my blog on Tumblr. And you are the co-founder and CEO of a fashion tech company called Bespokeify. Would you like to introduce your company for people who might not know what you're doing? Sure. So basically, we create custom designed and fitted apparel patterns instantly. And it's essentially the building blocks for a mass customized future for the industry. You take people's body measurements or 3D body scan and instantly convert it to a perfect fitted pattern. Yeah, so a pattern is like a template that the sewer needs to cut out the fabric, which is then sewn together for whatever design it might be. It might be a top like you're wearing, or it could be a men's suit. But whatever it is, it will be fitted to that particular person. Custom clothing has existed for a very long time, but it's been completely unscalable. Because you need skilled artisans to be able to take that measurement information and then convert it into a pattern. So what we've been able to do, and I guess we are the first in this sense, is automate that process. Remove humans completely from the equation. The goal here is to create a system for the fashion industry to move away from mass production to an on-demand custom model. And with that, you have all the advantages of it being ethical, You can spin up fashion brands really quickly. So now anyone can become a fashion entrepreneur. And that's kind of the future that I really want. So before we really get into the details of your work and how you came up with such an innovative product, how would you describe yourself? I would say I'm a very driven person. I know where I want to be. I work really, really hard at trying to get to that point probably at the expense of various other elements of my life, like putting time and effort into friends or family. It's always like a mental tussle for me to really think about what am I actually doing? And is this sacrifice and is this kind of journey I'm on worth it? I know that I want to leave a mark and I know that the legacy that I leave is probably going to be more important than any short-term sacrifice that I might make. But I might learn that that's not true as life progresses. But at this particular stage in my life, that's the fuel inside my veins. That's what's keeping me going. There's something that we talked about before that I really admire about you. It's when we talked about the purpose of life. You really genuinely want to improve people's quality of life and lead a change in the world. I guess I came to an understanding in my mind that the best I can make sense of this kind of world or this universe, it's that this is just an evolutionary journey and you're either contributing to that evolution or you're not. The technology that we've developed, artificial intelligence and all these sort of things are like the next step. We are manifesting something greater than ourselves. All we have to do as individuals is just contribute, build on top of the shoulders of others and provide something so that this evolutionary journey will continue beyond ourselves and beyond our species altogether, you know? It's good for people to hear that someone who's in business and doing tech aren't just doing it for some new tech that gets popular, but there's a bigger goal that everyone can contribute to. I'm still motivated by materialistic kind of things, but I realize now that you don't need that much to live a good life. You can get by on like $100,000 a year and live an amazing life. That means for entrepreneurs, you don't have to say, all right, I'm doing this because I want to become a billionaire. You can do it so that you can achieve some sort of higher purpose beyond just your bank balance. So once you get past the whole money thing, what really motivates you? What really drives you? And that's a really challenging thing to comprehend and to find peace with. You mentioned that you are very driven and you know what you want to do. Is that how you were like since you were younger? I think so. I'm the eldest in my family. I think eldest children typically have this kind of overbearing, high achieving attitude. You went to an elite boys school. Did that also contribute to you being very driven and a leader? The school pretty much is like a training program for future executives. 
it kind of just trained you to be a person that could eventually slip into these leadership roles within society and belong there because you understand the etiquette, you understand the expectations. You're trained to be more disciplined and disciplined. persistent than most kids. Correct. From what I know about you, there's a period of your life where you moved to the beach and everything kind of yeah. changed and went down, Correct. I would say. Yeah. So can you tell me about that period? <laughs> yeah. From kindergarten to grade five, I was in an elite boys' school in Sydney. And then my dad was quite sick because he was working so much. He was like, that's it. We're going to make a lifestyle change. We're moving to the Sunshine Coast, which is a coastal town about an hour north of Brisbane. It was going from this cosmopolitan, highly strung environment to like the complete opposite. All of a sudden, I was like this kid that was hanging out at the beach. And the first time I was at school with girls and in grade seven, the last year I was there, I just didn't care about school at all. But I also noticed myself that the school didn't share the same values deep down that I did. Although I enjoyed it, I knew that I was missing out that in Sydney, there was kids just like me that were more diligent and in a more competitive environment. And I just wasn't getting that on the Sunshine Coast. Would you say that you learned something important from that period? Yeah, one of the lessons I learned is the importance of putting yourself in an environment where you were set to gain the most and develop the most. If we leave schooling aside, I was a competitive swimmer. Actually, I was swimming ever since I was 18 months old. And in Australia, you can literally start to swim and then continually, incrementally just keep jumping from squad to squad until you're an Olympic swimmer. It's just seamless. So I could see that the quality in the Sunshine Coast, swimming-wise, was just not on that level. And I kind of wanted to put myself in Brisbane where there's a lot more competition, there's a lot more expectation, there's a lot more opportunity. So yeah, swimming definitely had a huge role to play in my mental development. Being able to develop that discipline and that understanding of how to put yourself in a situation to succeed. I always loved the idea of swimming with people that were better than me. You're always scared to be promoted to the next squad. The first week or two weeks, it's humiliating because you're just not on that level whatsoever. You're embarrassed, but you keep persevering. You get better, you master it, you move on to the next level. It's very easy to draw a parallel between that and, say, schooling. And there's going to be people in an environment where they're going to be amongst elite people and it'll push the overall standard through the roof. If you're not in that environment, you're definitely handicapping yourself in the long term. Moving to Brisbane was fantastic because I put myself back into that very elite environment. And this particular school that I went to wasn't as hardcore as the Sydney one. So it was like a happy balance between high achievement, but also learning good life skills. That also gave you an important opportunity for your career. That's right. In grade 12, we have an opportunity to start a couple subjects at university. And if we pass those subjects, we basically get a backdoor entrance to university. So it doesn't matter what exit grade you get from high school, you're guaranteed a place in whatever you're studying. So I thought, okay, this is my insurance policy. I'm going to do a couple subjects in say engineering or something, just to get into university and then I don't have to put the pressure on myself to get a really good exit grade. When you chose to go into engineering, did you know that it will lead into bigger things or was it just something that you wanted to try? I think I wanted to try. I was interested by the practical aspects of this particular class. We pretty much learned basic engineering material science and engineering mechanics. I knew that I liked thinking about things in an analytical way versus a creative or abstract way. Engineering is one of those degrees as well where you're just learning these core skills that will translate well to leadership positions or whatever it might be. So did everyone pretty much do that in your no. school? No. And it's really weird. You ask people, why don't you do that? It's like, no, I really want to study hard and I want to get a good OP so I can get into university. I'm like... Do you know why people are not doing that? I think it's just their condition to play life by other people's rules. If they've been told ever since kindergarten that they have to study hard so that they can leave school with a good exit grade and get into a good university and get a good profession. And then at the 11th hour, just before they're about to graduate, you say, oh, by the way, if you do this, you won't even have to worry about any of that. It's very hard for people to accept that reality. The second defining moment of my high school career was an opportunity to get a scholarship with a global mining company. One of the students' fathers was a CEO of this mining company. They had this program where 
you could basically pick your engineering discipline that was related to the mining sector. They would give you money each year to go towards your tuition. And they'd also give you undergraduate employment. And then once you graduate, they guarantee three years of employment. It was a big decision to make, like, do I really want to get into engineering? Like, is, is this it? Am I now committing myself to become an engineer? And what swayed me ultimately that there was only two people applying. I have a 50-50 chance of getting it. I got the scholarship and it's basically just take away the need for me to think about my future for at least the next five to seven years. It was basically guarantee you an employment in something that you know you're interested in at yeah, least. That's exactly right. And it's difficult for a high schooler to be like, okay, if I choose to go down this path, I'm pretty much going to be beholden to this path. But for me, the upside was just too big to ignore. It surprised me that only two people in my entire grade actually saw the opportunity for what it was. In university, you studied civil? Civil and construction. And you also worked in that related field? Yeah. While I was an undergraduate, I worked in business development, marketing, document control, structural engineering. I did some civil engineering and procurement. So I had this huge exposure to all these different areas of the business. I think every single job that I had within that company was invaluable. And I still take those lessons to what I do now. After you graduated university, you went back to work at the same company? Yeah. When I graduated from university, I decided I don't want to do structural engineering. I didn't like the environment. It was an elite environment. So I've been in these elite environments through swimming, through school, and then all of a sudden I'm in this corporate environment and half the people, they're only there because they want to get their paycheck. And I just hated that. And another thing I hated was how manual a lot of the tasks were. People are designing things from scratch over and over again when anyone with a bit of initiative could automate some of these processes and save so much time and effort. But it was perfectly fine because to do what they needed to do, get their paycheck, and that's it. That's all they cared about. So I wanted to try out marketing because I thought, oh, maybe it's an engineering thing. Maybe marketing will be more vibrant. I can be more creative and apply some of my analytical skills to that area. But Marketing was the exact same, if not worse, because the people in marketing are very different to engineers. They're not as analytical. So all of those problems I found in the corporate environment in the engineering department was compounded in the marketing department because I really just had that cultural misalignment with people that were in the department. I left the team and I negotiated a place back into the structural engineering team and I stayed there for another eight months before deciding to move to Thailand. So first of all, why did you choose Thailand? Australia and Thailand have a working holiday visa. I could get a year-long visa, number one. Number two, it was a cheap place to live. And the third reason was I had friends and I'd been here before. So it was a familiar place. I liked the city, Bangkok. And I thought, yeah, this would be cool. It's just like, a, like, I'm young. I have friends, you know. It just like seemed like the right thing to do for a young kid. When you decide to move to Thailand, did you know what you wanted to do? Yeah, I had this fashion business on the side. I just created a ballet flat brand and I spent a year developing the product as I was working as an engineer. Once I started selling, I realized it's just too difficult to juggle full-time work and try to establish and grow a fashion business. So I thought I need to put myself in an environment where I can focus 100% on the fashion business. Relatively speaking, if I was doing this in Australia, I'd be paying four or five times as much. So we got the Thailand part, but what about the fashion part? Because from your story, that seems to come out of nowhere. Yeah. How do you get interested in that in the first place? I fell in love with suiting in my teens. I love the craftsmanship and the story behind it, the historical place it's had in global society. Like every culture wears some form of a suit. One of the things I experienced when I started getting interested in clothes is that I never really felt as good as I hoped to when I was wearing them. And a large portion of that had to do with the fit. I have very wide athletic shoulders and very small waist. It's impossible to find products that fit me. I got the taste for tailoring when I went to Thailand. I think first year uni, once I got the taste of custom clothing, it really stuck with me. I took maybe another seven trips back to Bangkok to get stuff tailored. Everything you wear today is tailored, mate. And what you're wearing right now, both the shirts and the pants, you also created the patterns yourself? That's right. It was one of the first patterns that I created and I'm still wearing it to this day. 
I just kept reading about it. I started making friends in that area. So one of my really good friends, Mark Neighbor, he's a QUT fashion lecturer. He was on Project Runway Australia. And that's when I first saw him. And I liked his style. I liked the way he presented himself, his very technical way of working. And it kind of inspired me because it aligned very much with what motivated me with men's suiting. So one day I was sitting in a food court and I saw Mark walk past and I ran up to him like, I'd like what you do. We should hang out sometime. I want to ask you some questions. A friendship blossomed from there. So being around him and him teaching me the technical aspects, the engineering aspects really of what goes into fashion was wonderful. The opportunity behind the technical aspects and the supply chain aspects, it really satisfied that engineer inside of me. And I saw a lot of correlations between what I valued and what motivated me and what the fashion industry could offer. Let's get back into your Bali flat business. How did you get interested in women's fashion? Like, How do you come up with that idea since you said you were interested in suits? Mm. I was interested and motivated by the technical challenge of bringing a product to market that would connect to someone and they would love. It's a staple in every woman's wardrobe, but it's so fragmented. There's no like standout brand that's just creating a ballet flat. But who's going to really buy a ballet flat based on a brand? They're going to buy it because it's comfortable, because it looks good. The solution's simple. I just create a dedicated ballet flat brand and I literally called it A-flat. I was literally sitting in a burger joint with Mark and when I mentioned it to him, he encouraged me and that's why I decided to go down this path. You basically self-studied to be able to know all these things like material, where to find a manufacturer and even the design. You said that you carved the last yourself. Yep. Mark and I literally, having never done anything with shoes before, created samples. How do you learn how to do that? Books or what? I mean, Mark knows how to sew, so it was easy to sew the upper. The rest of it, I was watching YouTube videos, trial and error. I think you said you deconstructed some yep. ballet flats. Deconstructed a few pairs of shoes as well and took elements that I liked from both and combined them. You found a manufacturer in India. That's right. So when I was in Thailand, I met some guy who was a shoe agent and he hooked me up in Chennai in India. And I developed the product with him and his contacts. You went there yourself? I went there three times. The last time I went there was to smuggle 400 pairs of shoes through Thai customs back into Thailand so I could sell them. After this long journey of developing the product, leaving my job to focus purely on this, I remember getting an email from the factory and it said, you have $9,000 left to pay. and My heart sank because I knew that I had no money. I'd spent absolutely everything I had and everything that my family were able to give me on establishing this business and buying the inventory. And it still wasn't enough to even have a product that's ready to sell. After I started selling, because I had no budget to actually market the product, I was really struggling to clear it. So yeah, I just ended up with this inventory, huge debt. And I thought, this is not going to work. I don't care about this anymore because I've invested so much of myself into it. And what do I have to show? A warehouse full of rotting shoes now because they were in Chennai, the humidity and all that sort of stuff. It was horrible. It was the toughest time in my life. So how did you get past that point? I wanted to distract myself. So I went and saw the first Steve Jobs movie that came out. It was just the right movie to watch at the right time because it made me realize Why am I wasting my talents bringing a shoe to market? Is that really a testament to your abilities? Is that really a testament to what you care about and and the contribution that you could really make? They presented Steve Jobs as like he's some sort of crazy visionary that took a massive risk despite all the odds and he was successful as a result. But it kind of just made me go back to my roots and what I'm good at and what I care about. And what I cared about was being able to solve this problem so no one else would have the same problem that I did and make the same mistakes I did. I thought, okay, the obvious solution to this entire problem I got myself into is just producing on demand. And if you can do that, you can produce custom. And if you can produce custom, you can sell product anywhere in the world to fit anybody, not have to worry about returns, not have any money tied up in inventory. It was just so simple. I just didn't understand why no one was doing it on a broad scale. They were mainly just men's tailored clothing. So I went home that very night. I opened up AutoCAD and I built myself a parametric shirt draft. So I could just type in some measurements and it would change the shape of the shirt to fit that particular body. 
So most pattern grading is linear, which means like they take a shape and then they just scale it out. And they assume that every single person that might be bigger in the bust is also bigger in the waist, in the hip proportionally. So that's how standard sizing would usually work. Like the small is a certain shape and the medium is the exact same shape, just expanded. Yep. But people's bodies don't scale proportionally. So that's why, yeah, when you sell stuff online as a fashion brand, you have 25% of your product being returned because of bad fit. That mentality of just scaling things, it's great for mass production because you can standardize and silo your sizes. So you only produce a range of six products, but you're running with the assumption that that's all the size variation that you need, which we all know that's not true. So what? Being able to parametrically draft a fit allows you to eliminate all those limitations. So you figured out that this is basically a bottleneck in fashion production. If I wanted to start a custom business back then, I would have to find a skilled cutter, like some old dude that has been you know, drawing shirts for 30 years or something. It's just not scalable. So that's why when you look at a lot of these custom businesses, once you place your order, you have to wait four to six weeks to get it. Because you rely on one skilled human who's trained to only draw one type of clothing. Correct. When you got this idea about creating a parametric pattern, did you know at that point that no one's done this before? I knew that no one had found a scalable, simple solution to the problem. There are clunky applications or supply chain systems that don't really solve the problem, uh, just not what our generation would expect from a solution. There are these software that can help make drafting patterns better, but none of them are actually using the same calculations or the same automation technology that you're doing. So since it's something really new and you're basically merging two disciplines where it's really rare for people to know both engineering and fashion, how do you know where to even start something this new? Just go where you think you need to go. Start with what do I want to achieve and just do it. Don't think that there's a proper way of going about things. So I was able to merge automation engineering with fashion purely because I listened to myself first and foremost and I trusted my own instincts. I just referenced other people secondary to that. I went to pattern makers with specific questions I needed to ask to enhance my knowledge. If I had gone to pattern makers and asked them to give me a solution, the solution would be crap. I learned this from my own experience as well that A lot of people who studied in a certain field and work in a certain field for a long time, they don't know other perspectives of what other fields can offer. And like you said, if you go to ask pattern makers or fashion designers for a solution, then they don't know what engineering is capable of doing or how it can come into play with pattern production. So you have that perspective and from knowing all these different fields, you can combine them in something that give much more value than people who only know one thing could ever think of. Absolutely. And I want to point this out because this is the main reason I want to interview you is that you are basically carving your own niche in something that never existed before. You combine your knowledge and passion in three different areas, basically in fashion, in engineering and technology. But it's not just something magical that one day it just all clicks and it's poof a product. It's years of really crafting this. And persevering. Something that stuck with me in the very early days is what Woody Allen has been quoted as saying, like, success is 80% just turning up. So if you just keep chipping away, try something, learn something, iterate, improve, eventually you'll become the master of that particular domain. And it's particularly important for something that you can't really learn from someone. There's a lot of trial and errors and learning the whole way until you become an expert. And you can call yourself an expert. I am probably the most knowledgeable person in the world about parametric engineering. The only reason is because I pretty much pioneered it. I did it myself. I've had to like look at things from Victorian era tailoring books and dressmaking books through the modern fashion school blocks. and synthesize all this information along with analyzing anthropometric data, doing a lot of trial and error testing to come up with a parametric block that works for any body type. That's why I can say confidently that that I'm the most qualified person in the world to talk about it. So after I built that shirt, the parametric CAD shirt, 
you went to the executives of the engineering company that you used to work for. Yeah. I'm like, hey, look what I built for a shirt. I know it's just a shirt, but we can do the same for a pump foundation. And I think they were just impressed by the fact that I had the initiative to believe that I could do it. And it wasn't going to cost them much to set me up in Thailand to continue developing this for them. And yeah, pretty much I've been developing it for them ever since. We're still consultants. So for pretty much the first year and a half, you were mainly just focusing on making your product, like the codes, the automation, the engineering part, but you weren't really getting paid until after the yeah. second year. That's right. I mean, Bespokeify was one of those things that was percolating on the side while we were still making money through consulting to this engineering company. I decided to really delve into it when I was visiting a tailor and getting some stuff made and I mentioned what I'd done. And the guy was over the moon, really enthusiastic about it. He was like, if you can do that, I will even sell it for you. That's literally what he said. So that was a encouragement enough. And we started work on it pretty much straight away. And we pretty much got it to a state where it was ready to go. And then they got cold feet. It was because from their perspective, they had to make too much of a, a commitment. Like it's either use your technology and fire all of their patent makers or just keep using the patent makers even though it's much slower and not efficient. Correct. They just decided it wasn't worth it. Was that totally unexpected for you? Yeah, but it wasn't heartbreaking. By that stage, I already knew the value. So we just kept improving things. I had a customer contact me from Hong Kong. She runs a women's wear tailor, professional it's women's wear clothing. And it was already custom sized. So they were struggling with the scalability and the quality as far as getting that good fit because women's wear tailoring is very difficult. All of the solutions that she tried up until that point in time were not suitable whatsoever. She tried pattern makers, they weren't good enough. She tried improving measurement capture tools like using body scanners and they weren't good enough. She tried 3D modeling systems, virtually sewing and modifying patterns on a 3D form, wasn't good enough. She really, really needed this to work for her. And she worked with us and produced 700 samples over various different products. So the way you worked on this with her is that she would send you her own design and then you would convert that into paramedic patterns and then keep testing to see that it actually fits any body type. Correct. And then send it back to her to use with her actual customers. You both help her business at the same time as developing your own product which is this software that's exactly right it has been a collaboration and one that has mutual benefit for both parties she was so enthusiastic and so dedicated and patient and willing to develop this with us and her business was dependent on it and that's the kind of partnership that bespokeify needed honestly i would never develop a product unless i found a client who has the same enthusiasm, the same dedication, and is just as invested as I am in its success. Because if you can give them exactly what they want and revolutionize their business, you've got something that will be successful. And after that, you've been working with a few fashion brands like the denim brand right now and also the Australian army. Oh yeah, we've done some like military ceremonial uniform testing and there's a corset brand from the US. We looked at these different areas within the industry and we wanted to develop capability in each one and see what works and what doesn't work. It has worked for each instance and that's great because it means that Bespokeify ultimately should be able to do everything from lingerie through to combat gear. What would you say is the challenge of working with customers? Some customers can be very demanding. They take up a lot of your time, but they're good ones to develop a product with, so long as you can filter out the stuff that's going to be constructive and the stuff that's just too much. So if you develop something that is everything that one customer wants, is it really something that other people also get value from? Or are there features and stuff in there that is just a distraction from the core value of what you're building? So filtering that out requires a bit of discipline. We've always built Bespokeify in collaboration with someone, an end user, even from the very beginning. We always had that kind of reassurance that we're actually building something that people want. We weren't coding away in our office, you know, with our blinkers on and not really engaging with who ultimately will be needing it. So that's been a positive in the whole experience, knowing that we're actually creating something of value. But it has been a long process of research and development and trial and error. 
and working closely with our clients and having them remain committed and keep their faith in what we're doing. At the same time, you can't just rush something to market because you have the burden of having to make money. You can do that, but if the product isn't perfect, then you blow your reputation in the snap of a finger. You have to balance profitability with getting the product to where it needs to be to really have an impact. And it's a lesson that you have to learn over a long period of time because you've been struggling a lot with perfectionism. You wanted the product to be perfect and then you come to realize that you haven't made any money. It's been a continual struggle trying to balance the desire to get the product perfect, the need to make money, as well as getting that incremental validation that you're on the right path. If you're building a business by yourself, No one's there to pat you on the back and tell you you're doing a good job. Every now and then, you just get overwhelmed with this self-doubt. Like, actually, are we even building something of value? Are we actually doing something that's going to put food on the table? It's important to validate your ideas and you do that with customers. That's right. And having them giving you feedback. Yeah. And I guess that also feeds into my anxiety as well because although I've had success working with these customers and knowing that I'm giving them value, haven't been sure it was scalable. So you need to know that you have a big enough addressable market to really succeed. That's always been a bit of a concern of mine is like, oh, this is well and good, but the industry just doesn't exist really at the moment, apart from men's suiting. I'm creating a product that no one knows I actually need, except for a small, small, small niche. So once we do have a wonderful product that's ready to go to market, is that enough to really take the industry by storm? Or would we be dependent on some other critical solution being solved like the manufacturing? We've had this conversation so many times about should we get into manufacturing for these brands becoming like the apple of on-demand custom apparel? But for a bootstrap startup, it's very naive to think you can do that because we just don't have the resources. I mean, that still haunts me even right now. How would you give advice to other people how to overcome that kind of mentality when you're really down? So there's a book, Dale Carnegie's How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. Ali bought it for me, one of our team members. In that book, it gives you a bunch of techniques to try to deal with stress and give you some perspective. And one of those techniques is called What's the Worst That Can Happen? So whenever I become overwhelmed with a particular scenario, I I jump straight to what's the worst that can happen. And I build contingencies for all of those scenarios, if I can. If I can't, then uh, it becomes a bit more stressful. But in most cases, I can kind of work my way through it and think, okay, well, if this happens, then we'll do this and we'll do that. And I find a way out. At least that gives you some sort of D-Day scenario that you've planned and ticked off. And then you can just go back to solving the problem. Wouldn't the worst that can happen get you even more down? Because now you think of the worst that you didn't think of before. But think about it. Most people don't even ask themselves, why am I stressed? Why is this such a big deal to begin with? Ultimately, what is the worst that can happen from this particular scenario? And if you can come to terms with an outcome or a conclusion or some sort of way out, then you can move on to solving the actual problem that you're facing because you've just dealt with the anxiety. You know what to do if all hell breaks loose. It's been a good technique for me to deal with stress. So now you're working with a team of nine people? Yep. How did you get your team in the first place? My co-founder and CTO, Trong, he's a Vietnamese guy. We worked together on numerous other projects. He's one of those guys that I just knew had integrity, was really hardworking, good communicator, and just naturally evolved from modifying a WordPress theme to the automation stuff we're doing for the engineering company. And it just evolved into working on Bespokeify as well. You basically grew together since the first time that you found him on Upwork. Yeah. How would you say you lead your team? Like what's your leadership style and how do you motivate people to believe in the same thing that you do? At the end of the day, you have to be aligned with your team. We have complementary skills and we have complementary personalities. We all know what we're trying to achieve here. And that works. And it doesn't mean that you have to get up in front of everyone every day and be like, this is what we're here. This is why we're doing it. Rally the troops. You just have to align yourself with people that understand where you're trying to go and have the patience and the perseverance to get there. Because this is something that could even take a decade before we see any quantifiable return on this effort that we're putting in. 
Each person has their own reasons for working in Bespokeify that's independent of the broader mission. Some might be interested to learn as much as they can because they're early in their career. Others are motivated by the regimen and the structure that I put in place. Others are motivated perhaps by the culture of the company. I'd hope to think that as we become more established within our particular space, that they would also come to really understand and value the contribution that they're making in a broader context. But you have to understand that fundamentally people are motivated for whatever reason. So long as it's functional and everyone's adding value and pushes us closer to our goal, it works. That's ultimately all I can expect as a co-founder and CEO of my company at this stage because we're bootstrapped from the very beginning. When you said bootstrap, you meant that you're self-funded. Correct. So we've built everything from zero. We fund everything out of our revenues. When you run a company, you have two different choices. One, you can get funding and funding helps capitalize your business so that you can pay people and you can invest in machinery or whatever it might be to get your business up and running. The second is to bootstrap which means you earn your first $10 and then you take that $10 and you make $20 and then you use that $20 to make $100 and just grow organically. There's risks associated with both. On the funding side, you end up with a lot more responsibility and expectations and like a fixed time frame in which people expect returns and results. There are also expectations from the investors for your company to go to certain directions as well. Yeah, that's right. Once someone's bought into your company, they're also bought into the management, the vision. It changes the dynamic of the company that you're building. You have to be very careful with who you ultimately take money from. The second type being bootstrap is you have that complete freedom, but you're living like month to month. You don't know really what's going to happen around the corner. There's a lot more stress on the founder to keep things going and making sure that you have enough foresight to prepare if anything changes in case you have a down month. If there are certain months that you don't make enough revenue, you still have to pay everyone in your team the same amount of salary, right? Correct. So sometimes you also have to cut your own personal salary. Yes. There's that responsibility as well of being a leader to take that upon yourself. Correct, because the moment you start eating into other people's salaries is the moment you lose their loyalty and their commitment because you're basically breaching a trust. Because not everyone is a young entrepreneur. Some people have a family and kids. That's right. So I take this to bed with me every single night. And it's kind of cyclical because every month or two months comes back to really haunt me. And I'm like, holy shit, what prospects do we really have ahead of us? Are we in the right position we need to be right now to alleviate any potential risk? It's a really, really, really incredibly stressful kind of responsibility to have on your shoulders. Did you voluntarily choose to bootstrap? To be honest, it has been difficult to raise funds. When I first started shopping it around, prospective investors that I was talking to didn't quite understand what it was about. But the people that did believe in it evangelically were my customers. Ultimately, one of our customers became an investor. It's a very small investment, but it was like a token gesture or commitment from them that they believe in what we're doing and it didn't really change anything other than allowed us to set up a proper incorporated entity in Singapore, create an investable company basically for someone else to come in and, and give us additional funds. It would mean that you want funding in the future and you basically want to perfect your own ideas first before getting any further funding so that you're not influenced by investors to go in a direction that maybe you don't want to? It's not so much that. It's once you take money, there's a timer. And it means that you have X number of years to deliver some sort of return on investment. Another thing is that if things don't go well, then you don't have the power and the control to really work your way out of it. Your shareholders have an equal right to tell you what to do. And also, the more you sell of a company earlier on, the lower the value that you're ultimately exchanging your company for. You have to be strategic as well about how you plan your fundraising because if you raise too much too soon, then you might not be able to raise the next round to the same valuation, which means ultimately you're cutting your potential short. There's something that's always on the back of my mind about how can we do this as lean and as agile as possible? because there's a long journey ahead of us 
and there's no rush to fill up the bank account just yet. It's good also to keep people motivated and realize that we're on a tight tether and if anything goes wrong, then we're all equally going to be feeling it. At the same time, funding also equals credibility. If you've got funded, people will think you're legit. Fortunately, we've been able to build credibility in other areas, but definitely funding wouldn't hurt, particularly from like really high profile institutions or people in our industry. But you're also quite selective with who funds you, right? Yep. You wouldn't just take money from anyone. They have to understand the value of your company and they have to be able to be your mentor. I see investing in Bespokeify as a privilege. And I think we intentionally have a low valuation on our company because we want to send a message that we know that we could sell a lot more of our company at a higher value. But it's not about that. It's about who can bring the value to the table. And in exchange for that value, we will give you part of the company. It's like a partnership ultimately. And that's why it was so easy for us to accept that investment from our client because it's a strategic alliance essentially. They're invested in us, literally, and we're invested in them. Could you talk more about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis as the CEO of startup? In the early days, I did a lot of engineering work. You started building the codes yourself. Yeah. So I built all the most important pattern-related codes myself. So when you start a business, you're pretty much the only person that's driving it on every front. Marketing, business development, coding, talking to investors. I'm a jack of all trades. I do everything from accounting to office admin, like cleaning dishes. It all comes down to the founder or the founders. But that's the life of a startup, something that you have to do. There's no such thing as a job description. And even for our engineers, ironing 20 pairs of jeans one minute and then writing some parametric code the next. As you grow and your revenue increases or you get funding, you can then hire people to do other tasks. So we've hired engineers to be able to do the engineering work and work with our clients to develop their products. And that has freed me up to work more on the business development side. Your role has shifted from being more product and engineering focused to a more sales and marketing focus. Do you enjoy that shift? I enjoy it in the sense that I feel like we're progressing. And because I'm now seeing the opportunities flow in, I can see that we're on the right path. I don't enjoy marketing. I don't like having these repetitive conversations with people. So it's something that I would like to pass off at some point. I have goals for this company that I need to have time to focus on. And it's kind of being pushed to the side. I think you're pretty good at it. You know what to say and you genuinely want to help your customers. We had this conversation recently where a potential customer contacted you, but he wasn't sure about what he wanted at all or whether he can afford your solution or need your solution. But then you took your time to really explain all the options and really advise him on what he could do. And I remember I asked you, why do you spend so much time talking to this person who weren't really interested at the time? You said something always come back from really helping people. And in the end, now he wants to use your product. The original call was simply just to give him a perspective that I've learned from my experience and the mistakes I've made. And then from that call, they decided to adopt On Demand Custom and built their business around that idea. You weren't just selling your product. like You weren't just telling them, oh, I can do this for you. But you were advising them on a range of options that aren't your own that they really see the value of your advice? I think ultimately you're trying to establish a relationship and that relationship doesn't necessarily have to be rooted in doing work together. It could just be, I help you and I have value that I can add to your experience and your business or whatever it is you're doing. Whether or not you use it, it doesn't affect me. But if I was in that same position, I would like the same. It'd, it'd be nice to have someone who might have knowledge that I don't have and help guide me and inform me as well. I don't ever want to lose that. I know it doesn't make much commercial sense, but life isn't all about just making money or being opportunistic and trying to get what you can out of every situation. It's about just enjoying the journey and helping your fellow who's just about to make a potentially bad decision that you can share your life experience with and help them avoid. You mentioned that your role shifted a lot to more sales related and you've been answering calls and a lot of emails. 
And that came from an opportunity that you had recently. Yes. I've been one of the Business of Fashion Future Voices. So Business of Fashion gets 10 people from around the world that represent different approaches to the future of the industry. I was given an opportunity to write an article on how technology is taking over the fashion industry. And if you don't embrace technology and start to think of your company as a technology company rather than a fashion company, then you're going to be destroyed by a tech company. What's the title of that in case people want to Google it? Yeah, Technology is Eating Fashion. Okay, I'll link that on the blog and under the YouTube video as well. So that was great and it led to a flood of inquiries, meeting requests and lots of opportunities. I really want to focus on getting more content out there on the web and inspiring people to the way I see the industry and the future vision that I have for it and that we're trying to solve through Bespokeify. One of the important things that came from writing an article is that it gave you and your company a lot more credibility and it also positioned you as a thought leader. Absolutely. It's phenomenal. Being part of Future Voices, I could use that when I went to another conversation to talk to another client. and then. Just being there and having a conversation with like one of these global apparel leading companies gave me credibility to talk to the next one. So before you know it, you've got all of this cachet that you would never have had otherwise. The business of fashion opportunity was fantastic at establishing some form of credibility, which I've been able to build on. It shows the importance of getting your thoughts out there in public so that people can see your visions, your passion and your capabilities through what you write. And if you don't have anything that shows your thought process that way, then you're just another website or another profile picture. It's because they saw your article and the way you think. That's why they believe that they can trust you. It's definitely important to create content. But I think also the distribution channel is probably even more important. I can publish an article on Medium, but it displayed to what 10 people that have subscribed to my Medium blog. Or I can publish it on Business of Fashion and it gets shared 1,500 times in a few days. Getting those opportunities to position yourself as an opinion leader is just as important as the message that you have. You also look for those kind of opportunities yourself. You place yourself in contests and you went to a lot of events like the Startup Weekend Fashion Rise. That's right. Just putting yourself out there is really important. I did rise with one of our clients. I was not a very proactive networker or anything like that. And the client was very outgoing and very personable, made friends with everyone that came close to the booth. And from that, just one event has been incredible. We spawned so much opportunity from that. It comes to show that when you pair up with someone really complimentary, then you can bring the best out of each other and you both benefit. That's right. The technique that I've adopted now is You need someone who is the engineer, who knows a lot about the product and comes off as knowledgeable and competent. And you need the extroverted person to establish some sort of rapport and then hands them over to the technical person to close. It's a killer combination. I think that's really interesting because during the first episode, my other guests mentioned the exact same thing, that they did it with the knowledge of MBTI. So they understand different types really well and they would pair two types with this exact role. And they would always go together. Mm, It's something I learned, the importance of distinguishing those roles. Where do you see yourself in the future? Let's talk about the current company first, so Bespokeify. I want to get us to a point where you're shopping in Zara or H&M or Uniqlo, whatever. You try something on and it doesn't quite fit or you don't quite like the collar or the neckline. And you go up to the sales assistant and say, hey, could you make this for me and just change this neckline here and maybe actually change the fabric? I don't quite like that color. Can you change it to like a green? And then the sales assistant's like, yeah, sure. Just step into the change room, get a 3D body scan. And then a few days later or even a few hours later, it's ready for pickup or it's delivered to your home. That's what I think the future of the apparel industry should be because people should be a part of the creative process and be able to really control the ultimate product that they buy. And also from a brand perspective, it's better if we don't carry inventory or have warehouses full of stock that potentially might not sell. There's a lot of room for improvement. And I know that we're the best place to lead that change. I'm working towards that at the moment, piece by piece. How long that takes, I'm not quite sure, but I don't want to leave Bespokeify or exit until I've been able to do everything I want to do. 
Bespokeify is being able to carve a niche and potentially a healthy exit for me so that the next project that I undertake, I'll have the capital, the expertise, the networks behind me to achieve even greater heights. You told me before that the next thing you were looking into nanobots and also using resources in space. The thing about nanobots is that they can be used for so many different applications. It's like a game changer. So they can be used for biomedical reasons to be targeted weapons against disease, or they can be used for recycling, breaking down different materials so that we can reuse them. They can be used in mining, for example, taking the whole breaking down concept. That means mining not just on Earth, but mining in outer space so that we can grow our resources and output. I very much believe in the idea that humans should be spacefaring and that we should start to colonize the rest of the solar system and potentially the galaxy and then universe. We need people who have the resources to channel that into finding solutions and incrementally solving the problems to take on this new frontier. I think that's probably one of the most honorable areas that I could channel my focus and dedication in the future. I'm sure it will happen with or without me but I'd like to throw my hat into the ring and see what we could do as well. From all these experiences that you learned from your business, working with clients and working with your team, what would you tell your younger self? I would relay that message from Woody Allen that says 80% of success is just turning up. Probably everyone accuses millennials of thinking things happen much faster than they actually do. If you really want to be successful, you just have to keep persevering and you have to keep the faith that eventually all of this effort will result in what you are seeking to achieve. That's something that my younger self definitely needed to hear because I probably would have saved myself a lot of heartache and pain had I known that going into it rather than thinking, but I wanted to do this and I still haven't done it after six months. Why? I'm such a failure. Oh, how many times have I gone through that? Don't give up too soon even if that's not a fast enough gratification. That's right. It's important for entrepreneurs to find nuggets of validation to keep them focused and knowing that they're heading down the right path, particularly for entrepreneurs who come up with their own ideas and think, oh, this is a great idea. Everyone's going to love it. I just need to build it first. Maybe it is a great idea, but if it is a great idea, you will have people that will want you to achieve it and want to benefit from it at the end of the day. Don't start anything unless someone else is willing to pay you for it. This is just like tech entrepreneurship 101. Develop a minimum viable product, get that early validation, and then just build on top of that. Don't bet the house on building a gold-plated solution because by the time you get it to market, it might not even be anything that anyone wants. There is probably one other thing I would try to explain to my younger self, that success is a journey, not a destination. So you have to enjoy every single day. This particular experience right now and this particular increment of time, I will never get to do again. So I may as well make the most of it. And when I first started this business in a tiny 20 square meter apartment, hearing the wailing of that provincial railway line crossing every hour, sitting on this rock hard bed in this foreign country, at the time it was horrible. I just didn't appreciate what kind of journey I was on. That's something that I look back on now and think, wow, man, that's cool. I wouldn't trade that for anything. And I think it's wonderful to have had the opportunity to go through that because not many people do. That was a very important defining moment in my journey, just like right now is. Do you have any books that you would recommend that had an impact on you? I have six books that have inspired me and been important for me at different stages of my life. The first one would be Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. I read this when I was about 14 and at the time it just like completely changed my life in the sense that it completely opened my mind to the world of entrepreneurship and what's possible if you set yourself up to think in a particular way. That no doubt has put me on this journey that I have. If you're young and are looking for inspiration, I think that's just a great read. Give you an inspiration to basically go out and do things for yourself and not just follow the system. Exactly. Thank you. Perfect. (laughs) The second book would be Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a classic. It just gives you a good summary of interpersonal skills, 
which will help you achieve your goals better when it comes to dealing with people. One thing I really like about this book is that it's not telling people how to manipulate. A lot of books that teaches influence has that kind of undertone. This book, it really helps you understand people's needs and motivations. So once you understand someone, you can provide value to them in a better way. It's not like, oh, how can I manipulate this person and take as much from them as I want or make them give something to me? But it's like, how do you understand what they need so I can provide value to them? And this is what this book talks about. Exactly. It's a tool that you would use to be able to connect with people more effectively. There's another Dale Carnegie book that I mentioned earlier. It's called How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. I think it's important if you're someone who could be quite anxious to read it because it just gives you these techniques that you can use to control your stress and channel it into productive means. There's one more book. It's called Oh, The Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. And it's obviously a kid's book, but I think it's really inspiring because it kind of just paints a picture that the world's your oyster and it's done in a really fun and rhythmical way, which I think is, connects with anyone. So moving out of the self-help genre now to something that's influenced me a lot professionally, there's a book called The Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander, and it comes in a series actually. The second one's A Pattern Language. The Pattern Language is the running theme through both. Pattern Language is like a, a way of looking at the world. There's an established way of understanding something intuitively because you've yes. seen it used so many times. Yeah. So this has just given me an understanding that you can't ignore the tapestry of what's come before you. Everything that's happened in the past has culminated in what we have right now. And everything that will happen in the future will be built on the shoulders of what we have right now. Christopher Alexander applies this in the context of architecture. And he talks about how space and environment is influenced heavily through these established patterns. Practicality, functionality and Really understanding established patterns is key to everything that we do. As a result, I think everything that we do is quite intuitive and use these patterns in a way to make it as easy and simple as possible for customers. And the last book that I recommend is called Crossing the Chasm. And it's a book about how do you take an innovative idea that hasn't existed before and find a market for it. Not just find a market for it in the sense of early adoption, but how do you penetrate the mass market? That book has been great because it just gives you reassurance that you're not the only one that's struggling trying to find relevance in this big world of different ideas. You have to slowly work at it. You have to incrementally find a foothold here and there. And then from that foothold, you can grow into bigger areas. Thank you, Mark, for being on my show and letting me interview you and sharing a lot of personal experiences and your struggle. And I'm sure it's very inspiring for a lot of young people and even older people who perhaps want to go out there and do something that's their own ideas. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you want to learn more about what Mark's doing, you can find his company website at bespokeify.com and his article on business fashion. I'm going to link it in the description and on the blog post at pathfinderspodcast.com. All of his book recommendations will be there as well. Also check the website for upcoming interviews. You can learn about future guests and ask them questions for the next episode as well. And if you enjoy the podcast, if you learn something useful or interesting, don't forget to review us on iTunes. It would really help people who might need inspiration in their own journey in life find this podcast. Don't forget to put like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content. Thank you for listening. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mark, for being on my show and letting me interview you. Didn't have a choice. <laughs> We're with you all night long on Bangkok FM.